I can trust that. I can trust the personal myth that that is awake and alive in me. And that personal myth that is me is not myth in the small sense. It's my deepest heart's desire. It's the personal story of desire because my story is a story of desire. That's what the new story is. It's the story of the desire that we trust and our collective desires that we trust. So here we go, my friends. Here we go, right? Oh my God. Oh my God. And if you, you weren't able to make any of these things this summer, it's awesome that you're here. Welcome. And Krista is going to be leading an effort this, this year, together with Menka and together with Jacqueline and together with Jamie, together with Christina to really grow One Mountain Many Paths. You know, when, when I originally started it with Barbara Marks Hubbard, we called it Evolutionary Church. And everyone said to me, no, no, how can you call it Evolutionary Church? And back in 2010, I started something called the Integral Spiritual Experience with my friend Ken Wilbur. We did it for a couple of years. And at the Integral Spiritual Experience, which was based, the, the two that we did was based on this new story I was trying to tell. The first one was based on Unique Self in 2009, and the second one on what I call the Universal Love Story, which are both, were, those were early, early takes I was trying to articulate on on the, the, the vision of what we're now calling cosmorotic humanism. So there I started something called integral church. And everyone said, what are you doing? Integral church, why church, why church, why church? Right? Like, oh my God, right? Right? It's like, oh my God. So, so let's just feel this, right? Let's feel this deeply. Right? Let's feel this deeply. Right? It's like, no, we need church and we need synagogue, right? And we need mosque and we need secular humanist center, right? And we need Kirsten Zohar. And we need Jacqueline. We need every single one of us. It's like heart open. Like, like, just like, let your heart rip open. We can't leave church to the side. We can't leave religion to the side. It won't work. 70% of religion lives in a, listen to this, 70% of religion lives, 70% of the world lives, right, in a kind of organized religion. And evolutionary church is a great name, right, Medea? I don't know. We ought to still use it. One mountain, many paths. Evolutionary church, right? Evolutionary synagogue, right? Evolutionary Rosh Hashanah. Today's the second day of Rosh Hashanah, the Hebrew wisdom new year. Evolutionary Ramadan, right? Not interfaith, though. Not interfaith, right? Right? Interfaith Rick, my, my friend who just wrote in the chat box, interfaith became very placid. You know, interfaith was kind of when Jews who didn't believe in Judaism got together with Christians who didn't believe in Christianity, and they discovered they had a lot in common. <laughs> Does everyone get that? So it's not interfaith, right, Rick, my brother? It's not interfaith, right? It's something new. It's a synergy. It's something new. And it's why we, we originally named the center, Center for World Spirituality, when I first started the center with Ken Wilbur, Sally Kempton, early on, Diane, right? But the primary, right, was the primary founders where I envisioned it together with Ken Wilber. We started it together. We originally called it the Center for World Spirituality. That's how it started, right? We then changed the name to Center for Integral Wisdom because we wanted to actually include the word wisdom in. And it was really important. And then we realized that actually it, it's got to be bigger. It's got to be wider. And integral is a very important important word. It's a word that Aurobindo used well. My friend Ken Wilbur used very, very well in a beautiful way, integral theory. And of course, there's an important scaffolding and critical scaffolding in integral theory that's core. And we're doing the thing that, that's new, that's an emergent, right? That it's, it's a completely new and an ancient synergy. It's beyond, it's a world philosophy. And a world philosophy needs to begin to articulate the ground of a world religion, not a world religion which is dominating, not a world religion which is opposed to diversity, but get the sense, a world division as a context for our diversity, a world religion as a context for our diversity. And a world religion means a shared grammar of value. And a shared grammar of value means inherent value first principles and first values embedded in a story of value. Wow. And that's the book that I just finished with Zach. And I'm literally working on the final text of it right now and we'll publish it. And I hope, you know, in the next 
a very short amount of time. Okay, so wow. And this, it's only the articulation of a universal grammar of value. First principles and first values embedded in a story of value that can allow us to respond to the meta crisis. And that's where I want to go now with permission, okay? So just I'm going to check in one more time, right? One more time. And of course, virtues, Rick, who writes in the chapter, virtues are completely included. Virtues are a better word for virtues, right? Rick asking the chat box about virtues general. I'm not going to respond line, line, line by line to the chat box, but, but let's just for a second, Rick, you, you got me there, okay? So virtues, a better word for virtue is value. Virtue emerges out of value, right? It's a shared ground of value. A virtue is an expression, an incarnation of a value. So now let's step in, friends. Are we ready to step in? Are we ready to step in? Are we ready to step in? Here we go. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready to play a larger game? Are we ready to play a larger game? Are we ready to play a larger game? Are we ready to participate in the evolution of love? Here we go. Here we go. So let's do this, friends. So we're going to talk today about the meta crisis. And by meta crisis, we mean the cascading risk landscape that threatens us with both existential risk and catastrophic risk. And existential risk has two forms. One is the, an actual extinction, the end of humanity as we know it. And there's about 12 vectors that are at play quite seriously today that could bring us there. If there's not a deep intervention, but there's a second kind of existential risk that we've talked about before, which is the death of our humanity. Catastrophic risk, not the death of humanity or the death of our humanity, but large scale unimaginable suffering to large swaths of the life world and of humanity and of the animal world. Now, by the death of our humanity, what we mean is a creeping benign totalitarianism, what Zach and I refer to as techno-feudalism, in which the world becomes encased as a kind of Skinner's box in which free will, personhood, human dignity, are actually undermined without our even being aware that that's happening. I'm not gonna go down that road. No, that's a second book that we've completed on techno-feudalism. We're now in the editorial phases. It's unimaginably important. We've talked about it a lot. What's the response? And so there are three classical responses that exist. The first is what we might call the Doomer response, right? And the Doomer response means, you know, in a word, the Doomer response is, it's over. We've looked at these facts really well. We've studied this. The Doomer community, Includes people like Joanna Macy or my old colleague, Michael Dowd, who wrote a book called Thank God for Evolution, who's since become a Doomer. The Doomer community is one of the most intelligent, well-read communities in the world. And they've come to the conclusion, based on books like Overshoot, which is one of their classical texts, that it's too late. We've breached too many planetary boundaries. There's nothing more that can be done. And Christina Amelon, you often read in some of those texts and, you know, I feel how it, it moves your heart, right? And it, and it shakes us to our very core. And we, about two years ago, we did an entire first day of a mystery school, maybe someone can put it in the chat box, right, which is available online on the response to this Doomer move. But the Doomer move says, You've got to just grieve the end. And again, these are not superficial readers. These are people who've read a lot, who've come to a conclusion that there's actually no hope. Now, stay close. 
the Doomer community is rooted in a kind of subtle reductive materialism. So for example, my friend Michael Dowd's book, Thank God for Evolution, I remember when I read it, and, and I'm one of the quotes, one of the many, 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 many quotes that Michael collected for the book when it came out at the time, but I was uneasy about the book because it's actually suffused with a kind of subtle reductive materialism dressed up as spirit. And so I was, I was worried about the book then, that actually it wouldn't hold in the face of, of, of massive crises. But there's a subtle reductive materialism. Possibility is over that lines the Joomer community. And while I appreciate and can feel the impulse, it's ultimately wrong. Because it actually doesn't understand that actually the same possibility that moved reality in the first nanoseconds of the Big Bang and moved us from matter to life to mind, that same evolutionary impulse, which is the inherent telos of reality, the directionality of reality is actually alive today. And that actually evolution itself is the possibility of possibility. We're going to come back to that, but that's lost on the Doomer community. So we're, going to, we're going to return to that. That's, that's the Doomer position. Does everyone got that? Just a sense of it? Okay, that's one. Now two, the second position, which is I would say the most rampant position is denial. Now, so there's the doomer position, the denial position. Now the denial position has two forms, what I would call conscious denial and more kind of sloppy or unconscious denial. Conscious denial is you actually, you're familiar with some of the facts, but you just turn away. You're not willing to borrow Robert J. Lifton's phrase. You're not willing to face apocalypse or to face the possibility of existential risk. So you turn away. It's a turning away. It's a turning away of the face, a deliberate turning away, a kind of burying our face in the sand. I remember when my, my dear friend, Sean Raymer, who... I met when I was giving about a decade of wisdom schools at a retreat center in New York. And imagine, right, right, that, that we actually can facilitate this enormous, unique self-symphony of people teaching each, each the core shared story of value, but each through their own unique prism. But, but the same shared story, right, mediated through all the different storytellers, right? That's how you begin to scale. That's how you begin to evolve the source code. It's a very big deal. So again, I segued to this because we're in the second response to the meta crisis. Let's check the time, 141, perfect. We're in the second response to the meta crisis, which is denial. When I first talked about the meta crisis, I remember Sean Raymer, who I met at, at the first wisdom schools that, that Tom and I met at, right? You know, Sean says to me, why are we talking about this? And Sean's so beautiful and is his incredible partner, Victoria. Why are we talking about this? He says, it's hopeless. What can we do about it? And, and his impulse was, let's just turn away from this. I mean, Mark teaches about unique self, teaches about you know, new visions of enlightenment. But why are you talking about the meta crisis? And I started talking about the meta crisis intensely, 2010 and 2011. That's when existential risk became more real to me than real. And I called up then, you know, emergent from conversations with Malk, right? And, and which were emerging from seminars I gave in Europe and Ben Wadi. Shahati was there at those early seminars, the second shock of existence, the shock of the potential death of humanity, right? So Sean says, why, why are we looking at this? And, and Sean was basically saying, there's just no point. So that, and Sean wasn't, of course, advocating denial. He was just saying, it wasn't a negative denial. It was like, Let's not, there's no point in engaging this. There's nothing to say. And that's what pretty much all intelligent people said to me as I started talking about this. What are you talking about? First off, you're probably wrong. And even if you're right, what's there to do about it? So that's one of many shades of denial. Right? So there's a conscious denial. You know the facts. You deny them because you don't know what to do about it. And then there's a second more sloppy, right? And Sean's not at all sloppy. There's a more sloppy unconscious denial where we're kind of you, 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 <clears throat> you get a whiff of it. You, you can taste it. You, you feel a fragrance of it in the air and you turn away. 
that's what most of the world is. You read something in a passing headline about AI, artificial intelligence being existential risk. I talked about this five, six years ago at a bunch of talks in Belgium. Everyone laughed. All of a sudden, the last four months, you actually read in mainstream newspapers, artificial intelligence is existential risk. And I don't know if Simone is here with us today, but I look forward to talking to Simone about how we can actually write an educational program on Homo Amor and, and artificial intelligence. That was a bracket. But, but, but people turn away because artificial intelligence, just turn away. How can you talk about that? And so the last three, four months, it's been all over the newspapers. So people read the newspaper and they say, oh my God, right? artificial intelligence could be existential risk. And then, then they, go out, they go on with their lives because they, they don't know how to, how to hold it, right? Simone, welcome, right? And oh my God, they don't know how to hold it. So, so it's a casual denial. That's the second, right? That's the second approach, okay? The third approach to the meta crisis is domination. And I would call that the friend of my, you know, the approach of my colleague, Elon Musk. And Elon's looked at a lot of the data that I've looked at. There are in our world some, you know, overlapping, you know, there always are overlapping people. They're always a few steps away from overlapping people. We've looked at a lot of the same data. And Elon's absolutely come to the same conclusion about the reality of the meta crisis and existential risk. But Elon's response is domination. Elon's response is, and I, I don't think it's a malevolent response. Elon's response is something like there's no adults in the room. Governments are all short termers. No one's looking at the big picture. I've got to take responsibility and be an adult in a room. Now, Elon is a kind of, as Walter Isaacson pointed out in his biography of Elon, Elon is both an adult and a child and a complex figure. And this is not a discussion on Elon, blessings to Elon. Although Elon just kind of toned down this kind of new, you know, seeming, seeming apparent, you know, vitriolic attacks on different ethnic communities that have been happening recently. So I, I haven't tracked that carefully. So Elon, you got to take it easy there, brother. But, but Elon is trying to be an adult in the room. And he's saying, domination, I'm going to run the show. And if you want to know why Elon Musk bought Twitter, it wasn't an American move. It was part of an arching play that's connected to Tesla and that's connected to his satellites that actually encircle the globe. It's connected to an entire neural link system, which is you know, related to what I would call the death of our humanity, So we called it earlier, right? which is a, an invisible group of controllers that actually dominate and control the system that are transgovernmental. So Elon represents a certain version of a, a domination move, which from his perspective is, is benign. But of course, all domination moves begin as benign. So those are the three basic moves. One is denial. The other is the doomer move. And the third is the domination move. Okay, all three of those moves won't work. All three of those moves will not only not solve the metacrisis, they will deepen the unimaginable suffering of the metacrisis and will eventually lead either to the death of humanity or to the death of our humanity, one of those two forms or to unimaginable forms of catastrophic risk. So there has to be a fourth way. And that fourth way is not denial, right? It's not doomer, right? It's not domination, but it is what we might call the dawn of desire. And yes, it had to be a D, right? A double D, because Ds are always new beginnings, right? A decisive, directional, right? That's Ds at their best. Ds at their best begin new things, right? So there's this new decisive direction which is, we're gonna call it the dawn of desire or the dawn of desire and her dignities and the dawn of desire and her divinities. And I wanna talk about this dawn of desire, okay? Because this is the fourth way. And I'm gonna to turn to Jacqueline now. To take a second and read the code. This is the fourth way. The fourth way is the dawn of desire. And this, this dawn of desire is the new story of cosmorotic humanism. And I just wrote a, a code Right, um, and sent it to Jacqueline before. And I think Jacqueline got it, got it written up. It was like a couple of minutes before One Mountain. So Jacqueline, if you've got this and you can read us this code, just give us one read, we'd be blown away. Take us inside. Here you go. Hello. Yes, I got the code. Thank you very much. 
I'm just going to put it in the chat box. It'll have to be in two pieces because it's quite long. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Here comes the second. And Jacqueline, ye of little faith, you thought I forgot, but that's okay. No, 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 it's <laughs> no, okay. I didn't. No, you did. I didn't. You did. No. That's okay. Take it away. <laughs> there we go. Okay. There are three classical responses to the meta crisis the Duma response, the denial response, and the domination response. None of these can avert the meta crisis. Each of them deepens what is sure to be its devastating impact, its devastating suffering. There is, however, a fourth response, the dawn of desire, or said slightly differently, the dawn of desire and its dignities, or said slightly differently again, the dawn of desire and its divinities, living uniquely in us, as us and through us, both personally and in our newly emergent, unique self symphonies. This is the new grammar of value, the core first principles and first values embedded in a story of value, a story of desire, which is the great new story, the new cultural movement of cosmoerotic humanism. It is only such a story of value. Such an emergent cosmoerotic humanism that can generate the evolutionary intimacy, the new order of intimacy that responds to the global intimacy disorder that itself is the root cause of the meta crisis. Cosmoerotic humanism tells the story of eros value. Cosmoerotic humanism tells the story of desire value. Cosmoerotic humanism is the dawn of new possibility, the possibility of desire. Oh my God, was that fantastic? So first of all, I'll say two things. First of all, Jacqueline, thank you so much. Everything sounds better coming from Jacqueline, right? Because of Jacqueline-ness, and I have to say also that amazing accent. Okay. Was that was that so much better? Oh my God. And, and David, who usually resonates the code, Dave, we're gonna have to, you know, David's got an American accent and David is is full radiance himself. But David, we, we got it, we gotta say, I mean, British accent. Oh my God. Thank you, Jacqueline. That was beautiful. Is that beautiful, everyone? So this code is huge. This is a big deal, right? Big deal. Thank you, 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 Jacqueline. I'm so excited to be with you. I'm so excited about this code. So let's see, let's put the code again if we can. Let's just put the code in the chat box. Let's just kind of move it down a little bit. And I want to just talk about a couple of pieces of this code. And it, it's, it's, it's so important. And, you know, she whispered in my ear like a, a second before one mountain. Jacqueline wrote me this morning and said, is there a code? And I said, I'll, I, was, I was working on the manuscript. So I said, you know, hopefully there will be. And then I looked at my my clock and I realized, oh my God, it's like a couple of minutes before one mountain, there's no code. So this code just kind of came down and I sent it to Jacqueline and she immediately right, got it ready and, and just resonated it so insanely, insanely beautifully. Okay, can everyone just feel the code? Can everyone just feel it for a second? I mean, she's good to us, right? The Dharma is alive, right? The new story of value is alive and we're clarifying pieces of it. So this new, this new, right, this new, code, this code of cosmos, is, is a new formulation of the new story of value, which is cosmoerotic humanism. Okay. And I want to just, I want to catch it. This is the fourth response to the meta crisis, the dawn of desire. And what the dawn of desire means is, and let's see if we can kind of just, just grab, if we can, a couple of pieces of it. And we might go about five, six minutes late, but let's see if we can get a a couple of pieces of this. So number one, you cannot respond to the meta crisis as we've, as we've said many times, only by changing the infrastructure, by changing how we detect bioweapons, the waste, the wastewater, although we need to do that, absolutely. You can't respond to the meta crisis only by changing the social structure and acting new laws, although we need new laws and new ways of engaging, for example, technology, 
law is based on precedent. Technology is, is ever new and emergent and precedent, right? Can't actually, precedent law can't actually engage the new and the emergent. One of many reasons that law has been unable to bind technology. And so, so social structure is insufficient. We need new superstructure, but by superstructure we mean, and this is a unique set of phrases from cosmorotic humanism, a new grammar of value, right? which means inherent first principles and first values of cosmos embedded in a story of value. Now, what does that mean? Let's see if we can find that. So what that means is that actually, A, reality is a story. A, reality is a story. Story is not a human contrivance, right, Ted? Right, R reality is, is itself stories. That's not a made up idea. And we're gonna do, I haven't yet done it, an entire one mountain on this and the five structures of story that go all the way down the evolutionary chain. And Elena, this is of course key to the work that we're doing. So that's one, reality is a story. There's an ontology to story. Yes, human beings are storytelling animals, but not because that's some random cosmic social expression. Human beings are storytelling animals. That means that human beings are the human expression of a cosmos that is story. Does everyone get that? Right, reality is always story. And the movement from unconscious to conscious evolution is when we become conscious of the story, conscious of the fact that we incarnate the story, conscious of the fact that the story is an unfinished story, and that we become storytellers of the new story. That's the move from unconscious to conscious evolution. Unconscious evolution, it's an unconscious story. You can identify the storyline only from the later perspective of conscious evolution. So an atom is actually living in a particular story. And that story is a story of value. There's a set of values that govern the atomic and subatomic and molecular and macro and molecular worlds. The reason atoms come together to form a molecule is because they have a shared field of value. And mathematics works on a shared field of value. That's actually how it works. That's the language of cosmos. Cosmos is multiple forms of language. Language is embedded in cosmos, even as we are embedded in language. Right, one of the core structures of the interior sciences, as we've developed them, drawn from them and developed them in cosmorotic humanism is, is the language of value, which is the structure of cosmos. And that language of value goes all the way down the evolutionary chain. Now, that's unconscious evolution. That drives evolution. It's innate, inherent, and it evolves. And then that story comes alive when we become aware of the story. We can actually see the story, right? We can see, oh my God, Oh my goddess, there's actually a narrative arc to cosmos. There's a storyline, right? Being able to see the storyline, to detect the storyline is itself the movement from unconscious to conscious evolution. Does everyone get that? The story becomes conscious. And then again, I just listed four ways, right? It becomes conscious in me. I realize I am the story. One, two, I realize the story is unfinished. It's an unfinished story. I am the story, but the story is also unfinished. So therefore, that's two. And three, therefore, I've got to write the next chapter of the story. That's three. And four, I write the next chapter of the story by being the next chapter of the story, right? Four and five, I'm, I become the storyteller. Wow, right? Now, what's the story about, my friends? It's a story of desire. And what is desire? Desire is the erotic motive of cosmos. Cosmos is desire. Desire is the nature of reality. That's what evolution is. Evolution is desire. Now, desire desires value. That's what desire is. Value is clarified desire. Clarified desire desires to express itself as value. Now, now, now stay close. So at the the fundamental levels, I'm not gonna say the lowest, that's a, that's a wrong word, but let's call it the fundamental levels of evolution. So value is innate. And so when atoms are in a shared field of value, there's an impulse within atoms to become a molecule. In the same way, let's go back a little bit farther, closer to the Big Bang, right? About 380,000 years ABB after the Big Bang, there's an inherent desire in subatomic particles, proton, neutron, and electron, 
which are each forms of quarks, no, particularly protons and neutrons are quark forms, up quark and down quark. There's an inherent desire between protons and electrons, for example, to create a larger hole, and they share this inherent desire for this larger value, and that value is called an atom. The desire of subatomic particles to become an atom is their core need. Because at that level, at that fundamental level of cosmos, there's no split between need and desire. Does everyone get that? Need and desire are the same. And need and desire remain virtually isomorphic, virtually identical through virtually every level of the world of matter the physiosphere, and then the world of matter triumphs in what we call in cosmorotic humanism, the second big bang, which is the biosphere. And the biosphere, again, there's this desire. And it's a desire for what? For more value, and more value means more life, and more value means more uniqueness, and more value means more eros, and more value means more creativity, and more value means right more intimacy. And each one of those is a precise word that we, we've articulated in cosmorotic humanism and interior science equation to talk about each one of those. Wow. Now, again, need and desire are the same. It's a need. Need and desire are exactly the same at these levels of evolution. Now, at some point we get, we go through all the levels of the biosphere and we get to the savanna and the human being, Homo erectus, right, gradually, right, emerges. We, we, we're standing up straight and and at some point, debatable when, argument between historians, but at some point, 75,000 years ago, 400,000 years ago, at some point, two new dimensions emerge at virtually the same time. And one is language, and the other is art, aesthetics. From those come trade. And there's this new third Big Bang, life triumphs in the depths of the self-reflective human, and to borrow a word from the Russian cosmists in like 1915, right, the, the noosphere, the world of, right, culture, ideas, transmittable ideas, right, to the next generation emerges, which is allowed for through language and through art and through trade, but language is the core. Now stay close. As the human emerges, there's an apparent split between need and desire. So there's this apparent, oh, my needs are what I really need, and desire is what I just desire. That's only an apparent split. When I go deeper inside and I actually clarify what do I truly need and what do I truly desire, not what are my surface desires or what are my pseudo desires, or using the language of cosmorotic humanism. What not what's the pseudo eros that covers over the emptiness, but what's the core eros, which is my core need and core desire? Eros means desire. Eros is what one mathematician who wrote Principa Mathematica with George Bertrand Russell called the appetite of cosmos, the appetition of cosmos. So cosmos has appetite, cosmos has desire. That desire at some level of the self-reflective human right, is able to, right, enact a new possibility, which is a higher level, a more apparent level, a deeper level of choice. I begin to choose, and, and I begin to be able to discern between my pseudo-desire and my true desire. What I called together with my, my beloved evolutionary homemate, Barbara Marks Hubbard, we called it your deepest heart's desire. And your deepest heart's desire is actually your clarified desire. It's the dawn of desire. Your clarified desire is the realization that the evolutionary impulse, which is evolutionary desire, lives uniquely in you as you and through you. You are, I am, we are clarified desire. I'm no longer merely homo sapien, who's told by the religions, conquer your desire because we don't trust you to get to your true desire, to your deepest heart's desire. We're afraid of your pseudo desires. We're going to tell you what you desire. You can't trust your body. We'll tell you what your body can do. We'll tell you what you're allowed to desire. You're allowed to desire what we tell you is desirable. So that, that's the beginning of, of oppression. It was perhaps in part a necessary stage in culture, 
But we now need to transcend that. We need to be at the dawn of a new age of desire, a new possibility of desire, in which the human being begins once again to realize, who am I? I am the cosmoerotic uni universe in person. I am evolutionary desire in person. Evolution is desire. Evolution lives uniquely in me, as me, and through me, and I am a unique incarnation of evolutionary desire. And my desire is the desire of she. It is the desire of cosmos. It is goddess's desire. It's God's desire, if we can use those words. It's reality's desire. It is the telos of reality itself, living both in me personally and in us collectively, in me as an irreducible unique self and in us as unique selves coming together in unique self-symphony. And unique self is not merely separate self. Unique self is not separate self who's a skin encapsulated ego, who we can't rely on to trust their desire because the skin encapsulated ego, the separate self who's lost in the optical delusion of separateness, views everything as rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics. And my desire seems to be always the expense of your desire. And I've got to be in competition with you because I'm trying to survive and, and it's me against you. And it's, it's a zero sum competition. So I've got to trance end that. I've got to end that trance realize I'm true self, I'm, I'm one with the field of desire, but then I've got to realize that field of desire is seamless but not featureless, and I am unique self, I'm that field of desire's unique feature, and who am I? I'm a unique configuration of desire. That's who I am, I'm a unique configuration of desire, and my unique desire is needed by cosmos. Now, now stay close. And at this level, need and desire come back together. Did you get that? Just like for subatomic particles, need and desire are isomorphic, for the new human and new humanity, the fulfillment of Homo sapien, who views him herself as a separate self, Homo sapien is fulfilled as Homo amor, who understands him herself as being unique self, the unique discretion of true self, the unique discretion of the field of desire, the unique, a unique configuration of desire. Simone is a unique configuration of desire needed by all that is. And Simone's desire and Simone's need are the same. My clarified desire, not my surface desire, my clarified desire and my clarified need are precisely the same. Wow. Did you get that? So I've got to begin to trust my desire, trust my body. I've got to clarify my desire. What is clarified desire, my friends? Clarified desire is clarified need. And what is clarified need? Clarified need is clarified desire. Let me say it again. What is clarified desire? I'm going to add something with your permission. Clarified desire equals value. Give me a drum roll, my friends. Oh my God, clarified desire equals value. That's what value is. Desire is a desire for a new value, for a future that's not yet here, right? Can you feel that? That's what, that's what desire actually is. Do you get that, how gorgeous that is? Right, can you get that? Clarified desire equals value. And my clarified desire is unique. And so I have a unique contribution to make to the shared field of value. Okay, everyone begin to feel this? Like, oh my God. And, 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 and this is the battle, right? This, it's so precise. It's so gorgeous, right? And I wanna, I wanna bring this home just in, in one very real way. You know, a year ago, we talked about Masha Amin, who was brutally, brutally killed in Iran. And we, we played a song, Baroi, which is for the sake of, what we need to do for the sake of. And Masha Amin was an expression of she, of the field of desire of the feminine. And the feminine wants to take its scarf off. It wants to not just be seen through the slit of eyes. And it's not about this kind of Western degradation of dress. You know, the West is often the opposite, where there's this kind of degradation of dress, where there's not a kind of tastefulness. There's not a kind of holding the beauty and subtlety of dress. That's a, that's a Western degradation. It's one of the, the shadows of Western freedom. But the other degradation in the world is the covering up of desire and the degradation, the degradation of she, the degradation of the divinity 
and dignity of desire. That's what Masha Amin stood for. Yeah, that's what she stood for. She stood for that dignity of desire. And there's a song that's actually going around, right, in Iran today, a year later after Masha Amin passes. And I want to play that song for you. And I want to first, let's just put the words in the chat box if we can. And this is a song about the dignity of desire. That's the fourth response to the metacrisis. The fourth response to the metacrisis is to actually clarify our desire. Is our desire such that we're fully empty? We can't access our deepest heart's desire. We can't access our desire for community. We can't access our desire to be responsible for the unborn, for future generations. We can't access our desire to create a world in which there's not 2 billion vulnerable people who are split off. Is our desire reducible to lowest common denominator in which we extract and to feed that lowest common denominator frenzy, that frenzy of the hungry ghost, which needs to consume and consume and consume. We develop an extraction model, which extracts from planet Earth what it took billions of years to create in a system of fractional reserve banking, which is a frenzy of pseudo desire driving exponential growth curves that fall off. That's pseudo desire. That's lowest common denominator, unclarified desire. The response to the meta crisis is to generate a new story of value in which we live in a new story of value comes from only one place, clarified desire, the dawn of desire. It's not denial. It's not doomer. It's not domination. It's the dawn of desire. Christina sent me the word dawn this morning. We were looking for D words, dawn. I thought of the word desire, the dawn of desire, right? the dawn of desire. What's the dawn of desire? It's the dawn of the dignity of desire. It's the new story of cosmorotic humanism. And the new story of cosmorotic humanism is I become desire in person. Homo amor is the cosmorotic universe in person. Homo amor is evolutionary desire in person. And I've got to be able to trust my desire. Stay close. Stay close. Let's look at the words to the song, friends. Let's look at the words to the song. And I want to play this song. Okay? I want to play the song. Let's go, let's go deep, okay? The fourth response to the metacrisis is to actually reclaim the dignity of desire in every unique human being and in our shared field of desire. And from that shared field of desire, create new intimate communions and new unique self-symphonies to actually create, to generate the new world from the new human and the new humanity. Homo sapien fulfilled as homo amor. Trusting, clarifying, our deepest heart's desire, being willing to go deep into our bodies, deep into our traumas, right? deep into our brokenness, and know that we can trace it back to its root and find our goodness and find our truth and find our beauty, and that we don't need to control a human being because they're empty of the field of desire and its dignities and its divinities, which is the doomer response, right? which is the domination response, right? And, and it's also part of the denial response. The denial response says, I'm going to deny because there's nothing to do. Yes, of course, there's something to do. Of course, there's something to do. What's there to do? Tell and be the new story of value. Move from unconscious to conscious evolution, which is the realization that we're going to cross to the other side. To cross to the other side is means I, I'm done being just homo sapien. I'm done being just a separate self. I'm done with the degradation of my desires. I'm gonna to begin to trust my somatic intelligence, to trust my, my deepest embodiment, my deepest insoulment, a term that, that we're using in the metapsychology that, 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 that Zach is working on and I'm working on the school of personal myth and we're bringing them together. I can trust that. I can trust the personal myth that, that is awake and alive in me and that personal myth that is me is not myth in the small sense, it's my deepest heart's desire. It's the personal story of desire because my story is a story of desire. That's what the new story is. It's the story of the desire that we trust and our collective desires that we trust, which are not the short-term desires of, of the political structures and the economic structures that are built in a rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics that, that produce a world of, of brokenness. We can trace our broken hallelujah back to the holy hallelujah. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's the revolution in Iran that's been going on the last year. It's one expression, but it's one of many expressions. 
So I want you to let, let's put one more time in the chat box. Let's put at the bottom of the chat box, the actual words to the song. Let's play the song. And this is going to be our prayer today. Our prayer is this song. This is our prayer today. And the person who wrote the song was arrested. We don't know his status right now. And I want to ask everyone, as you listen to the song, put your desire as prayer. Desire is prayer. Prayer is desire. Prayer is to express and to turn to the field of desire, to the personhood the infinity of desire, the infinity of intimacy, which is the field of desire and say, oh my God, help me, hold me. And I hold you and you, and I help you. And we're, we're partners with the infinite field of desire. We're partners with goddess. We're partners with she. And so as we hear the song, I'm gonna invite everyone, if I can, to the field of desire and to pray in the chat box and pray by saying, put your deepest heart's desire for yourself, for your life, for your own humanity, for other people that, that need, whose desires need fulfillment, for the desire of humanity, let's pray our desires into the chat box as we hear this holy, sacred song, okay? Let's look at those words, my friends. Let's look at the chat box. Look at the words, right? Look at the words and, and, and you know, just look at the words. Just be it together. I mean, it's just, it's gorgeous, right? Right. And, and I want to offer you a new way to pray with your permission, everyone. So tenderly permission, everyone, just for the last minute. Can we offer and articulate this new way to pray? When I say I pray, I say I desire. To say I desire, to say I pray. To say I pray, to say I desire. Do you see how that changes what we think about prayer and how we feel prayer? Prayers become this outmoded structure, right, to a, a homophobic, you know, antibody, you know, ethnocentric God that's somehow alienated from cosmos. No, no, right? The field of she both holds cosmos, holds me. Every place I fall, I fall into her arms. She knows my name and uh, she lives in me as me and through me. And I participate in she at the same time. To pray means one thing. Prayer is palal, P-A-L-L-A-L. Palal means to consider the nature of reality. And how do I consider the nature of reality? I, I find my deepest heart's desire. And my deepest heart's desire always is value. That's what reality is. Reality is the desire for ever more value. Evolution is the evolution of desire, which is the evolution of intimacy, which is the evolution of value. There's not that eros is a value. Eros is value. It's eros value. It's desire value. It's one word. Just like there's love intelligence, one word. In cosmorotic humanism, we talk about love intelligence and love beauty, one word, and love desire, one word. These are signatures of cosmorotic humanism. So there's eros value. There's desire value. It's one word, right? Oh my goddess. Trust your deepest heart's desire. Find your deepest heart's desire. Find my deepest heart's desire. We collectively find our deepest heart's desire. And here in one mountain, many paths. And Evolutionary church and evolutionary synagogue and evolutionary secular humanist center. What's our deepest heart's desire? Oh my God, we stand with the past. And we take the, the baton of the past. We stand with every human being and with all of life and the present. And we hear, we hear the call of the unborn of the future. And we're in a revolution, right? We're in revolution. We're in evolution. We are evolution in person. Desire rages in us. Clarified desire. But that's who we are. We are clarified desire. We are the dawn of the new desire. Oh my goddess, what, what a crazy honor to be starting the year again with you now. Let's do this, my friends. Let's build one mountain. Let it explode. Let it explode so that we can actually share together. We can tell the story together. We're, we're at a moment of metacrisis. The doom response will destroy us. The denial response will destroy us. The domination response will destroy us. We got to go to a, a fourth response, which is this new, it's a new decision we have to take. It's a decision about the dignity and divinity of desire, the dawn of desire, as you, as me, as she, as we. Oh my God, thank you so, so much. What a crazy privilege to be with you.